You remember last week I spoke on resisting the Spirit, quenching the Spirit, grieving the Spirit, and even blaspheming the Spirit. And I guess when I think about the times that I've grieved the Spirit of God, that's what I think of, that I just drove another nail. I'm thankful for the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for the mercy of God. But without that, you're looking at one hopeless dude. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. And I just want to say that, that Seth and Abby looked really, really good in their prom pictures. Amen. Amen. Half of you look better than the other, though, Seth. Thank Amen. You. I'll let you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thankful for you being here today. And it's just the mercy of God uh, that we're all well and uh, we can all afford to be here. But you know, that song also talked about a man that wanted to live for Jesus. And I believe that I can speak for you this morning in saying that you want to live for Jesus. Amen. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. amen. Well, today you're going to learn how that's possible. You know, when some people read the Scriptures, when some people hear the Word of God preached about how God expects us to live, they say, oh man, I couldn't begin to live that way. There's no way that I can hold up to God's standards. They say, man, the Christian life, it's just too hard. And I want to submit to you this morning that being a Christian ain't hard. It's impossible without the help of the Holy Spirit. You see, God gives Christians the power to live a Spirit-filled life. The moment that you ask Jesus to come into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, that is the moment that God gave you the gift of the Spirit of God and the ability to live the kind of life that He wants you to live. And He's not giving you the Spirit of God just so you and God can hang out together. That's a good thing, amen? amen? But the Spirit takes up residence in you to make a difference both in you and through you for the glory of God. He is the one. He is the source. He is the one who empowers us to live a holy life and to offer an effective witness for Jesus Christ. He's the source of our power. And because He's the source of our power, that means you've got to plug in. Can I get an amen? amen. If you want the Spirit-filled life, you've got to plug in to His power every single day. You can't do it on Sunday and not do it the other six days of the week. If you want to live a Spirit-filled life, you've got to plug into the Spirit's power every day so that you can live out your faith. So today, the Bible's going to show you. The Bible's going to show you why we need the Spirit of God in order to live this Spirit-filled life. Why do you need the Holy Spirit? First and foremost, because God's Spirit will guide you. If you would, in the Bibles in front of you, on page 957, we're going to be reading from John chapter 16, where the Lord introduces the Holy Spirit of God who enables us to live the kind of life God expects. 957, John chapter 16, beginning in verse 13. Listen to what Jesus says says, however, when he, that's a person, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he 
will take of mine and declare it to you. You see, the work of the Holy Spirit is a, uh, a multifaceted one. The Holy Spirit doesn't just have one role to fill in your life. The Holy Spirit has several responsibilities in your life. Romans tells us that the Spirit of God joins with our spirit to confirm that we are children of God. And that's a good thing. Can I get an amen? That's a good thing, but that's not all that the Spirit of God does. John tells us here that the Holy Spirit of God serves, serves the believer as a teacher and a guide for our Christian lives. Okay, so how does he do that? How does the Spirit of God that I can't see, that I rarely audibly hear, how is the Holy Spirit going to guide my life? Well, first of all, the Holy Spirit will help you understand the Bible. We all know that before we became Christians, understanding the Bible was like trying to read Chinese. Amen? You might as well have not done it because you couldn't get it. You couldn't understand. You couldn't, you couldn't get what God was saying. But over time, through prayer, through teachers, and through preachers, as you begin to seek the will of God, things began to change. The light began to illuminate. You began to see, and those blinders began to fall off. And as those blinders started coming off, so to speak, the Holy Spirit began to teach you and began to help you to grasp even those hard-to-understand truths like what I'm sharing today. But not only does the Spirit guide us by helping us to understand the Bible, the Holy Spirit also guides us by revealing more and more about God and about Jesus. Now, in this series thus far, the Bible has taught us about several roles that the Holy Spirit uh, has, but the primary role is to glorify the Son of God, to glorify Jesus. The moment that you invited Jesus to take over your life is the moment that the Holy Spirit began working in you to help you grasp the awesome, worthy of imitation attributes of Jesus. It's then. So if you don't have an ongoing personal relationship with the Holy Spirit of God, you will never appreciate, neither will you ever understand the glory of God. Why? Because you don't have an ongoing relationship with the Spirit. You ain't got the Spirit's help. So you can't understand all those wonderful, incredible attributes of the Son of God. Friend, listen, the Holy Spirit wants to be actively involved in your life. He desires that. He loves you so much, and He wants to be actively involved. He wants to help you grow in your understanding of the Word of God. He wants you to help you to understand God's Word and also help you to appreciate God's Word. Why? Because He wants you to know God's will for your life. And he knows that the Word of God outlines and establishes for us the will of God for every believer. But not only will the Spirit guide you through a deeper understanding of both the Word and of God, God's Spirit will also help you to overcome sin in your life. If you would, on page 1004, in the Bibles in front of you, we're going to go to Romans chapter 8. And I want to share with you a very powerful passage that has many critical truths about this issue of overcoming sin in the life of a believer. Romans chapter 8, we're going to begin in verse 9. And I want you to keep in mind who Paul is writing to here. He's writing to believers. He's writing to Christians. So he's recognizing that Christians struggle with sin. Do you? Yes. Amen. We all struggle with this sin issue. So he's telling you here, here's how you overcome it. Amen. Verse 9. 
But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body... If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. No, we are debtors. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will will live for as many as are led. Say led. led. Many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. Remember that we are given the Spirit for a lot of different reasons. Yes, to live out our faith. Yes, to guide us in our steps. Yes, to have boldness to tell others about Jesus. But one primary reason why we are given the Holy Spirit of God is to overcome this issue that we all acknowledge we have that is overcoming sin in our life. But for this to happen, the Bible tells us that we must be willing to permit the Holy Spirit to lead. And that means if He's going to lead, what are you going to do? Follow. Follow. Amen. In that passage in Romans... Paul gives us three key points that we ought to consider. Number one, you are controlled by a new nature. You are controlled by a new nature. That sin nature no longer has power over you like it did before you came to Christ. Yes, your old sinful nature tries to get a hand on the steering wheel. Amen? But the new nature is now what's in the driver's seat. How many of you understand uh, what I mean when you have an annoying backseat driver? <laughs> Raise your hand if you, have, if you know. Amen? I know. I know. <laughs> Are you one or do you know one? I know one. <laughs> <laughs> you might not be in the backseat. You might just be on the backseat. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> we all understand what I mean when we say a backseat driver. That annoying backseat driver is always trying to give you bad directions and bad advice. Amen? You know, when Janet and I are together and we're driving down the road and I'm driving, Janet always asks me, how did you ever get around without me to tell you where to go? And then you know what I say? I don't know, darling. Amen? But it, <laughs> Good answer, amen? But here's my point, y'all. At least now, as believers, at least now, as Christians indwelled with the Spirit of God, you got a choice. At least now, as a believer, indwelled by the Holy Spirit, you have a choice between right and wrong. You have a choice between good and bad. You have a choice between better and best. You can either give in to your old nature's Nagging. Amen, Tim? <laughs> you can get in to your old nature's bad directions or you can let the Holy Spirit direct your path. At least now, you have a choice. You see, you're controlled now by a new nature. But also, you need to know that the Spirit that raised Jesus, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? The Spirit that raised Jesus is the same Spirit that resides in you. Now, y'all don't seem very flabbergasted by that statement. But I think it takes a lot to raise somebody from being dead, don't you? In fact, I can't think of a greater power than raising somebody from the grave. Not just dead, but good and dead. Amen? Three days dead. Amen? And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit who had the power 
to raise Jesus from the dead now lives in you. That supernatural power that raised Jesus good and dead now lives in you. That supernatural power that you have can now help you to resist sin. Don't feel like some helpless, floundering believer. No, friend, you are empowered by the supernatural power of God to resist sin and to help you overcome sin. So therefore, you are, you are indwelled by this new nature. You are also indwelled with the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. But thirdly, you need to know that you no longer have to. You no longer have to give in to sinful urges. Before, it may have felt like you just had to. But you no longer have to. I'm not talking about New Year's resolutions here. I'm not talking about wishful thinking here. I'm not talking about empty yearning here. Friend, listen, you probably already learned that if you're, you're going to try to live this life, this Christian life, uh, as a morally upright and godly person in your own strength, you're going to fail. We can't do it in our own strength. We can't do it in our own power. We fail and we fail miserably. And that's why God has sent His Spirit. Friend, if you will rely on the power of God's Spirit day in, day out, minute in, minute out, all throughout your days, if you will rely on Him, the Bible is clear that you will be an overcomer. The problem is we lose that connection. We, we take that opportunity to not follow the Spirit's lead. And that is when we fall to sin. If you would, turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. That's on page 1037 in the Bibles in front of you if you want to go there. But Paul's talking to another church. Another group of believers, right? Jesus is talking to his own disciples first. And then Paul writes to the church at Rome... And now Paul's writing to the church at Galatia. Man, these believers ain't nothing but a bunch of sinners. Amen? Does it sound familiar? It should. Because the makeup you were putting on that person this morning, the person that was shaving in that mirror this morning, same problem the people in Galatia had. We still have this struggle with sin. Listen to what Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16, tells us. Paul says, I say then... Walk in the Spirit. Say walk in the, walk in the Spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's a powerful verse of Scripture right there, my friend. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Do you hear the war going on? But if you are led by the Spirit, say led by the Spirit. Yeah. If you're going to be led by the Spirit, then that implies some followings going on. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. But the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and of the like, which I tell you beforehand, just as I've told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, say live in the Spirit. Amen. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Friends, that little passage right there gives us four quick reasons why we need the Holy Spirit to take full control of our life as believers. Number one, 
The Holy Spirit helps us to control the sin nature. Here's what you said. You said that if we walk in the Spirit, we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen? Isn't that great news that we have help to control that sinful nature in the back seat? Amen? Sometimes you try to crawl over the front seat and you've got to give him the elbow. Amen? And you knock him back to where he was. The Holy Spirit will help you. He will help you. He will help you go the right direction if you will listen to his direction. That's the problem with many believers is they're hearing but they're not listening. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Number two, the Holy Spirit also makes it very much easier for us to follow God's standards. Look in verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. When we listen and follow the Holy Spirit's direction, then we won't need the law to tell us which way to go. No, we'll want to go the way God wants us to go. We'll want to obey Him. Do you see the difference? You're no longer forced to follow the law. You want to go God's way. You want to go the way the Spirit is leading you. So we've got to walk in the Spirit that we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We've got to be led by the Spirit under which there is no law. But number three, the Holy Spirit will produce godly qualities in your life. You will begin to look like Jesus. When we live by the Spirit, when we are led by the Spirit, He begins to develop these godly qualities in our life that the Bible calls fruit. The fruit, the evidence of godly living, love and joy, peace in your life and patience, kindness and goodness, faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Friend, do you see those evidences in your life? You say, well, Brother Bill, I got about eight of nine, that patience thing in <laughs> my thing. I live in Athens, amen? <laughs> but we begin to see all of those godly evidences being manifested in the life we live. Why? Do we do it in our own strength? No. We walk in the Spirit so that we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We're led by the Spirit of God because there is no such law over those who are led by the Spirit. And we want to please God. We want to honor the Lord. But number four, the Holy Spirit also and helps us to seek God's approval over man's approval. When you're following the Spirit of God, pleasing God and glorifying God becomes this. Everybody do this. Becomes your number one priority. There is no greater priority in your life than honoring, pleasing, walking in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, living in the Spirit of God. See, what happens is, is we begin to know that when we make that the number one priority, everything that comes under that, our marriages, our families, our circles of influence, our churches, our country, even the world in which we live are all influenced by the Holy Spirit. But it only happens, friend, when believers walk in the Spirit, when they're led by the Spirit, when, according to verse 25 there, if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. See, it's not only, it's not that you have to. The Holy Spirit's not into arm twisting. He's not trying to force you. You truly want to because He is your one. Following the Spirit's lead makes living a life for Jesus 
A joy, not a duty. It's not forced. It's a desire that you have. God's Holy Spirit will guide you. God's Holy Spirit will help you to overcome sin. But listen carefully to number three. Because equally important in the eyes of God is the understanding that God, God's Spirit, will empower your witness. In Acts chapter 1, Luke writes to the disciples exactly what Jesus said. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said to his the disciples, but you shall receive power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me. In Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the end of the earth. Now I find it very interesting here that in verse 8, that is the primary reason why the Holy Spirit has been given to us as believers. That we would be witnesses unto Jesus. In other words, that we would be bright shining reflections of what Jesus looks like in a lost and dying world. That we would be the imitators of God. That we would be those who shine the light into the dark places of this world we live in. You see, one of the greatest things that the Spirit of God wants to do in your life is to give you greater courage, to give you increased ability, and listen to this, also expanded opportunity. To share your faith with somebody else. Can I ask y'all a question this morning? In light of these perilous times that we're facing today, do you have any desire whatsoever to see other people be saved? from the eternal punishment of being separated from the presence of God. This past Wednesday, in our Bible study, we focused on one verse of Scripture that has replayed itself over and over and over again in my mind. And I know that it's not Bill that's replaying it. I know it's the Holy Spirit. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9, Paul's talking to believers again. And he tells them what will happen to those who have not placed their faith in Jesus. And here's what he says in verse 9. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Y'all, I don't know what that looks like, but I don't like the sound of it. But that's not it. That's not the worst part. Because he continues on. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Here comes. From the presence of the Lord. And from the glory of His power. No more light. No more hope. No more love. No more of all those other nine fruit of the Spirit. No peace. No goodness. Just everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His power. If you think it grieves your heart, imagine how it grieves the Spirit's heart when we don't follow His lead to take the gospel good news to these who are facing verse 9. And I'm more guilty than you are, I promise you. But 
But that's one of the most important reasons that the Holy Spirit has given to you. It's not all about you. Can I hear an amen? amen. The Spirit is not all about you. Yes, He will help you to overcome sin. Yes, He will guide you. Yes, He will embolden you. But it ain't all about us. It's about that person facing verse 9. And we can't give up. You know the one in your life that I'm talking about, don't you? Nod your head. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a family member. Facing verse 9 today. And we're not following the Spirit's lead. In verse 8, Luke used a word in the original Bible language that is dunamis. Dunamis means power. When the power of the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be my witnesses. Power. Dunamis is where we get our English word dynamite. It's where we get our English word dynamic. Dynamo. And what you need to know is, is God didn't give you this dynamite. He didn't give you this power so that you could feel something. He gave you this power so that we could accomplish something for the glory of God. So that you can accomplish something in your circle of influence. So you can accomplish something in your family. So you can accomplish something in that lost person's life. So they don't face verse 9. See, sometimes the Holy Spirit's power kind of acts like dynamite in our life. The Holy Spirit's power will blast us with this overwhelming zeal to get the gospel good news out there. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will jolt us from being self-satisfied and complacent and lazy in sharing our faith. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will motivate us to be spiritually stronger than we've ever been so that we can be a light in the darkness. Other times, God's Spirit is like a dynamic, generating power that helps you to live day after restless day, day after perilous day, revealing the evidences that the Spirit is alive and well in you. And yes, people see that. And it's a thing that we never could have done on our own. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit. Friend, in these perilous times, do you find yourself a little bit timid? A little bit timid in your witness for Christ? Do you, do you find that it's just, it's a little bit hard to speak up in your life? It's hard for you to, to speak up about what you believe in. If so, today, I want to encourage you to tap into the power God has made available to you through His own Holy Spirit. God's Spirit has promised to give an added dimension of boldness and power and influence like you have never seen before in your life. That's what the Spirit does. Boldness. Power. And influence. But once again, you got to walk in the Spirit so that you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You've got to follow the lead of the Spirit so that you don't have to live according to the law because you want to. And that you will live in the Spirit and therefore walk according to God's Word. You got to follow the Spirit's lead. And my prayer is today that you'll follow the Spirit's lead because He's invited you today. If you're an unbeliever, He has invited you to be saved from sin. He's invited you to be granted eternal life in heaven by receiving Jesus Christ 
as your Lord and Savior. But that's not the only invitation that he's offering today. Because I know there's a, a great many believers here today. And so I'd also like to extend another opportunity to everyone in this building to respond to the Spirit's lead. To heed the lead. Amen. Say heed the lead. Heed the lead. I want you to heed the lead because I know how the Spirit's leading you. I want you to heed the lead by committing to participate in Bethel's Grow Outreach Ministry. Now, many of you responded last week. In fact, 29 of you responded last week to commit seven hours this year. And we're probably going to end up postponing it one month, so it'll only be six hours this year. To come here on a Tuesday of your choosing, either the first or third, you'll see it on your golden ticket that's in your bulletin. You choose when you want to come. You choose what you want to do when you come. There's all manner of teams that you can be a part of that have one focus. And that is... Helping people outside these walls fall under the condemnation of 1 Thessalonians chapter 9. Being cast into punishment of everlasting destruction from the presence of God. So friend, if you are listening to the Spirit's lead... I want you to know you don't have to. You don't have to be a part of this outreach ministry. But can I tell you that you should want to? Say, yeah, Brother Bill. Yes. You should want to. Because I know how the Spirit is leading you right now. The Spirit leads His own to glorify Jesus, to guide us, to help us to overcome sin. But primarily, certainly equally important, is to empower our witness and our influence. So this invitation is not only for the lost, it's not only for those who have yet to come to Christ, it's also for you believers who are listening to the Spirit's lead. And during this song, our prayer, your prayer, should be to participate in something that helps people avoid verse 9.